Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians, guests, and friends. Special welcome to those of you also who are on Zoom for our September 16th meeting of the Rotary Club of Cincinnati. We are really happy that you're here with us today. We have a great program with two speakers. We will begin with the national anthem, followed by the invocation and four-way test with Dr. Hux Miller. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity you have given to all of us to be members of an organization like Rotary devoted to doing good in the world. As you know, none of us is perfect or omnicompetent, but sometimes working together we can accomplish something of note. Help us to figure out how we can serve to make your world a better place. And today we are blessed by the example of the Ronald McDonald House, who recognized the need of children and families for a place to stay during a time of illness and figured out how to meet that need. Let us be inspired by their example. Amen. And now let us repeat the things as Rotarians that we think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. You may be seated. Next, we will have our prospective members, guests, and visitors introduced by Bill Stilley. Good afternoon, and I too would like to welcome my dear friends and visitors to Cincinnati Rotary Club 17, the 17th oldest Rotary Club in the universe. We have uh, one uh, guest uh, this morning, if you wouldn't mind standing up so that we could recognize you, Adil Fardahib. He's uh, coming back from California. and. Adil has already participated in one of our hands-on projects and, quite frankly, really worked hard. We thank you and we welcome you. Thank you, Bill, and welcome, Adil. We also have our district governor, Carol Hughes, with us today. We are really excited to have her. Carol, would you stand? We're going to hear from Carol in just a minute. We're very excited to hear about what's happening in District 6670 and to have Carol with us. The announcements have been shortened today because we have two speakers. We have some birthdays for this week. Members celebrating birthdays, September 14th, Ken Saunders. If you're present, please stand. September 14th as well, Ed Atchison. September 16th, Paula Ash. September 17th, Sam Schutte. And September 20th, we have three birthdays for September 20th, Kathy Machinga, Mackenzie Bennett, and Roger Grind. Let's give them a round of applause for those upcoming birthdays. We have a road show next week, so please do not come to the Hilton in downtown Cincinnati next week for lunch. Our road show will be at the Revel Urban Winery. This will be, we are going to bump our fifth Thursday road show meeting because of a large convention that's coming downtown. We're going to move that fifth Thursday to the fourth Thursday. So please make a note of it. We will be at the Revel Urban Winery and it will be a happy hour from 5.30 to 7.30 next week. So we'll be back in the Hilton again on September 30th. We will have a variety of uh, appetizers, um, and you will hear from the owner of the Revel Urban Winery. They own wi that particular winery and others also in the US. So you will be hearing from them and having some light refreshments that evening. District 6670, Rotary Day of Service, you've heard about that before. We're really excited. Uh, District Governor Carroll may mention something about it. We had our foundation president and district governor-elect, Frank Scott, speak about the Rotary Day of Service last week. It is a build-a-bed project where we will be building 100 beds uh, and uh, 100 mattresses and bed sets to help children who uh, are sleeping on floors and providing beds for them and their families. The World Affairs Committee, the Ghana Project, is the project that will be sponsored for the 2021-22 year. Please save the date. 
November th the 10th. That will be uh, a project, an event to sponsor and raise funds for the Ghana Project through our World Affairs Committee. We have uh, two great chairpersons of that committee and they're here today. If they could just stand, they've been doing a lot of work. Uh, Chuck Martz and John Farmeyer are the chairpersons of the World Affairs Committee. And the people to contact for the Ghana Project, who are typically our boots on the ground, are Tony Archery and Before Archery. If they, please stand. With the Ghana Project this year, part of the focus will be 5,000 textbooks for students, 500 dual desks. As you remember, on one of the previous presentations, there would be four students around one particular one desk with instruction is going on. So there will be 500 dual desks, 40 bookcases, painting, and also medical supplies will be delivered to them as well. We did some partnering uh, with the um, one of our other organizations for some medical supplies before. So we're really looking forward to that event, November 10th. Members in the news, if you would please keep our executive director, Linda Muth, and her husband, Tom, in your thoughts and prayers. If you noticed in the E-Rays this week, there was an announcement in the family news. Tom was diagnosed with bile duct cancer last Tuesday, Linda's husband. She has set up a Caring Bridge site to keep friends and family informed of Tom's condition and treatment. So that link again is in the E-Rays if you didn't have a chance to see it. We've been in communication with Linda. As you know, she has uh, submitted her retirement, and so we've been working closely with her, but even more so now with the uh, issue that she and her husband Tom are faced with. So please keep Linda and Tom in your prayers and thoughts. Again, our next week's meeting will be a road show at the Revel Winery. If you would please put your reservations in today, you know, many times we are people of last minute with the reservations, but it would really help Christy because Christy is taking on some additional responsibilities now. So if you plan to come next week, please, before you leave, do your RSVP so Christy can have a good total count of projections for the number of people that we will have next week. Um, with that, now we'll do split the pot. I will ask our guest speaker, Executive Director Jennifer Loeb of the uh, Ronald McDonald House Charities and our Ronald McDonald House here in Cincinnati to pull the winning ticket and list the last four digits of the uh, number. Okay, who has 9009? It's the last four. Woohoo! Congratulations! Thank you, Jennifer. The winning pot is $150 today. The rolling pot um, winner is about $500, $537. Pulling for the Queen of Hearts, the Seven of Hearts. The Queen, you want to show the Queen? She, Mary Dornetti won. Let's give Mary a round of applause for winning the pot, $150. I just want you to know that Mary called her shot. She turned to me and said, I'm winning today. <laughs> okay, there you have it. So call your shot and you may be the winner as well. Congratulations, Mary. So again, we're gonna go on with our program today. We have two great speakers. We will begin with our district governor and introducing our district governor today will be two-time past district governor, Bill Shula. Thank you, President. I'm honored to be able to introduce our district governor, Carol Hughes, today. As you can tell from her accent, she was born and raised in England, and Carol and her family emigrated to Ohio in July 1993. After 15 years as an elementary school teacher in the primary in England, uh, she served 16 years with the YMCA and 11 years with the Springboro Chamber of Commerce. Carol is now happily retired. Carol is a devoted Rotarian, a member, was a member of the Fairfield Rotary Club for four years, 
and most recently he's been a member of the Springboro Rotary Club for the past 15 years. In July 2021, she was fortunate to become our district governor for District 6670, leading the 48 clubs in Southwest Ohio. Our theme, again, service above self is a motto of Rotary and Carol lives it every day. She excels, she excels in building community relationships on a regular basis. Carol lives in Springboro, Ohio with her three dogs. Her four adult children live in Indianapolis, Waynesville, Springboro, and Hamilton. She has two grandsons, Cameron and Corwin, and two granddaughters, McLean and Evie. And she has a friendship with the Ray Camp, who is a district governor of 6560 in central Indiana. She lives the RI president theme for this year, serve to change lives. Carol. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> I'm not very good at standing still, so I'm just going to wander around on the stage here. Um, <clears throat> Serve to Change Lives is our theme this year. And you can see our, our logo there, the official uh, Serve to Change Lives logo. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about branding. Um, you, your club does a great job of correctly branding yourselves. But um, when you work with another organization on a project, you're allowed to create your own logo for that, um, for that event by doing what's called the um, lockup logo using the correct Rotary logo on the bottom next to another organization's logo. So it becomes an official Rotary logo. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we're going to start by le le hearing about this quote from Paul Harris, our founder. Paul Harris said this in, in 1935. He said, this is a changing world. We must be prepared to change with it. The story of Rotary will have to be written again and again. And think about how relevant that statement is in the world that we live in today. This was almost 100 years ago this was said. Think about how we live our lives today compared to two years ago even. So Rotary will be written again and again. And I'm sure your Rotary Club has had to adapt. The people on Zoom today are not with us. Two years ago, we wouldn't have even dreamed of doing this, would we? But here we are having to do life differently. <clears throat> Here's our logo again, Serve to Change Lives. And here is our international president, Shaker Mehta. So I'm, I'm the elected official for District 6670, and I report directly to Shaker. We went through a lot of training together. There's about a three-year lead-up to becoming district governor. <clears throat> He's a member of the Calcutta Mahanagar Club in India. Dynamic, very motivational speaker, fantastic gentleman. Um, he wants us to think big and do big. He keeps saying this over and over in training. Set goals that are lofty goals. And well done, Melinda, for getting all your goals on Rotary's website, by the way. Um, for your club. So think big and do big. And one of the other things he talks about is each one bring one. He wants Rotary to grow. He made a, a comment during training that when he joined Rotary 30 years ago, there was 1.2 million members. Well, guess what? There's still 1.2 million members 30 years later. He wants us to grow Rotary. And he wants us to do it by this, this way. Each one bring one. So each person, <clears throat> find a way of inviting somebody, like Ariel did today, invited this young man sitting next to her that I chatted with a little bit earlier. Each one of you could bring somebody to lunch. In invite, buy them lunch and let them experience what you experience being part of this powerful organization that we all belong to. So each one bring one. I challenge you to invite somebody. Bring a friend, bring a neighbor, bring a family member. I visited a club two weeks ago. There was two father-son teams sitting next to each other. So dad had invited his son to join Rotary. You heard about my kids. My youngest son is a member of the Hamilton Rotary Club, and his wife is a member of the Westchester Liberty Club. So yes, family, don't forget about family. Family would love to be involved. Family would love to enjoy what you enjoy about this wonderful organization. So don't forget, each one bring one. Yes, 
Um, we are doing two days of service this year. Um, one is on September 25th, which is next Saturday. It is in Springboro. It is um, a short 50 minute drive from here, so you can all come. And we are building 100 beds, like Melinda said. Um, the next one will be on April 30th, and it will be in partnership with an organization called Rebuilding Together Dayton. What they do is they keep um, the elderly in their homes by maintaining their homes for them. So we're the volunteers that day, and that will be in the center of Dayton. So a, an official Rotary Day of Service has to be recognized by meeting this criteria that you can see on the screen here. You need, need to have more than one Rotary Club involved. You need to invite other, another organization to be involved with you. You need to invite family, friends, neighbors, and other people to volunteer. And then you need to document the event on Rotary Central. And so we are doing that for next weekend, um, and we will do the same in April. One of Shaker's initiatives is all about empowering girls. Did you know that women make up for more than two-thirds of the illiterate people in the world? Two-thirds of women. So think about how challenging and how um, disadvantaged many, many women are around the world. Young women especially who don't go to school um, during one week of the month because they, there are no bathrooms in their schools. Um, 62 million girls are not in school today and millions more are fighting to stay in school. So how can we empower the girls in Ohio? How can we do that? that you're gonna start seeing some initiatives coming out and some trainings that we're going to share very soon. Another thing Shaker wants us to do is take a real good di deep dive into diversity. How can we as Rotarians be more open and inclusive? fair to all, build goodwill, and benefit our communities. Who do you know that you would love to invite to become a Rotarian, to enjoy what you enjoy about Rotary? Who do you know? Let's be more inclusive. <clears throat> We're doing a Youth Peace Symposium in April. We've got two fantastic co-chairs who are chairing this. Um, we're actually starting a People in Action um, um, peace, uh, peace uh, training in October and we're going to invite about 100 students to join us for those trainings, and then we're going to finish the year with the Youth Peace Symposium. It will be in Dayton on April 23rd. We've got seven college professors who are skilled in talking about peace and diversity and inclusion, and they're going to do a project as well, uh, several different projects. We're also going to have a gala dinner in, in April next year, and the, the district conference will be inside of that dinner. It will be part of the dinner. Um, Carolyn Park on Friday, April 29th. I'd love to see some Cincinnati Rotarians at that too. And let's talk a little bit about the foundation. The Rotary Foundation is the fuel that keeps the Rotary engine going. We, we could not do projects overseas to help those less fortunate than ourselves without donations to the Rotary Foundation. And as you know, and I know many of you know this, maybe not everybody, but whatever is donated to the foundation three years ago, a percentage of that comes back, and that's how we do district grants. So remember, when you're applying for district grants, if you're, if you're contributing, that's your dollars coming back to help people in your community. And polio, of course. World Polio Day, October 24th. I challenge the Cincinnati Rotary Club to do something around that day, even if it's just an awareness, an event, some kind of something. Um, clubs are invited to donate $1,500 to World Polio, so I would, I'd challenge you to do that. Um, we're going to also be doing some Governor Excellence Awards. I'm recognizing at the end of the year um, clubs that have stepped up and done some good work and have added members and have um, had some great projects around your area, and um, I, I want to recognize those people. Okay, let's talk about your club. So, we've got a little bit of a discrepancy here. I know on Rotary's website you have 293 members listed, but in DACDB you only have 236. So, you're somewhere in there, you're either paying for way too many people or you're not paying for enough. So, if somebody could get that corrected, that would be wonderful. Um, you, in, in Rotary's website, it says you have 211 men and 82 women. You have 12 members under 40, which is wonderful. We, you know, we're being asked to try and bring our average age down by adding new members that are under 40. 
Great job, Melinda. Foundation Giving, your club has been so generous over, over your history. $818,000 that you have given collectively. That's fantastic. And of your 293 members, 103 are current Paul Harris Fellows. That's fantastic too. Um, you've got eight eligible to be Paul Harris Society members. Paul Harris Society members are people who tell Rotary that they're going to donate $1,000 a year. And, when they, and then you get recognized for that donation. You've got six major donors. Major donors are Rotarians who've given $10,000 over, over time. And you have six of those. I haven't seen that kind of number anywhere else. And then you've got the Bequest Society members. These are members who have told Rotary that they are going to leave $10,000 or more to, uh, to Rotary in their will. So you've got five of those. Well done. Congratulations. <clears throat> now, let's talk about age. Who'd like to guess the average age of the members of your club? 62? 65, I think I heard. So you think you're younger than you are. <laughs> Your average age is 69, and this is why I'm bringing this up. Um, last year's international president, Holger Kanak, was very, very um, interested in studying average age of Rotarians. We all know average age of, of service club members is, is getting older, okay? So he studied his country. In Germany, he was very surprised and disappointed to find that the average age of German Rotarians was 65. And he said to his German friends, we have got to bring this age down because we're going to die eventually. The club will die if we don't change something. Then he studied England, my home country. Average age in England is 75. We have a problem here. I've spoken to three clubs this fall already where their average age is over 70. One was 76, okay? And I'm saying to these clubs, who is gonna do what you've done if we don't change something here? 10 years from now, if we don't change something, that number is not gonna look like that. It's gonna be way higher. So what can we do? Invite people, each one bring one. Invite that young co-worker, invite that neighbor, invite that family member to come and enjoy what you enjoy about being a Rotarian. Okay, 69. Don't forget that. <laughs> Got to do something about that. So um, here's some questions that I'm asked to share with you. Melinda, after this, I will send this presentation to you. So you can maybe talk about some of these questions at board meetings. What's your club trying to accomplish? Who's your audience? How does your club take action? What has been your impact? So talk about that with each other and then really focus on how are we going to sustain the Rotary Club of Cincinnati into the future? How are we gonna do that if we don't change something? What do you want your audience to do? And then, do we need to change? Yes, we do. Should we change? Yes, we should. The question is, do we want to change? And here's a quote. Change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. It's within all of us to make a change, invite somebody to come and enjoy what you have enjoyed for so many years about being a Rotarian. All the projects that you've done, all the people you've helped, all the lives you've changed, all the impact you've had in your community. Invite someone to come and enjoy what you enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, District Governor Carroll. Thank you for that great information. Uh, that you've given to us. And just so you know, DACDB is an accounting system, and we use Club Runner, which is a different system. So uh, we'll be working on some of the numbers that she mentioned because they're two different um, accounting systems that hold our membership, as you could see from her slide up there. So thank you so very much, uh, District Governor Carroll. And on behalf of our club and 
Rotarian, Dr. Charles Pierce. We have a small presentation for you. It's a disc. Could you stand up, uh, Rotarian, Dr. Pierce? Dr. Charles? This is a, a disc that Dr. Charles wanted to present to our district governor with some history of Rotary, and Charles is a photographer, so it has some great pictures as well. And thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Next, we will have our program presenter today. We have Jennifer Loeb, who will be presenting and introducing. Jennifer will be uh, Rotarian Al Conscious. We'll give Jennifer a running start here. Thank you, President Melinda. Today we're very pleased to have uh, Jennifer Loeb, the CEO of Ronald McDonald House Charities of Cincinnati. I've had the pleasure of knowing Jennifer since 1998. She has uh, served as CEO in that entire time. Under her leadership, Cincinnati's house has grown from a small 20 bedroom to become the largest Ronald House in the world with 177 bedrooms. And the, those that uh, volunteer at the Ronald House, uh, you'll get a chance to get a tour next time you go there. The, the new wing is entirely open, uh, another 97 rooms that brought it to that 177 number. And that was after uh, Jennifer uh, and the board launched a $52 million capital campaign and succeeded in raising all of it. Jennifer is a frequent local and national speaker on topics of fundraising, culture, and not-for-profit management. She was named YWCA Career Woman of Achievement in, 19, in 2020 named one of uh, Cincinnati 40 under 40 by the Business Courier in 1999 and is a graduate of Leadership Cincinnati class number 30. Jen has earned bachelor's degrees in English journalism and theater from Miami University and a master's degree in journalism and health education from the Ohio State. Please welcome Jennifer Loeb. Thank you. Thanks, Al. I was waiting for the zinger. Al's on our board, and he's, he's always the one who cuts in with a joke just at the right time. So I was braced for whatever he was going to say, but I was very above board. Thanks, Al. Um, thank you all for having me today. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to be honest, it's the first time I've worn a suit in 18 months. <laughs> I actually had heels on this morning, but I realized that's a superpower that I lost during the pandemic that <laughs> will probably never wear heels again. So sorry about that, had to ditch those. But I'm really happy to be here with you today to um, tell you more about our Ronald McDonald House, about our recent expansion, about what makes our house so important for guest families. Um, and I have a lot to cover, so I'm gonna move pretty quickly and we'll have time at the end for some questions. So the mission of our house, a couple words I just want to point out that jump out are compassion, community, and steps away. So our house surrounds families with love and support while their kids are at the hospital. It's a community that they can live in while they're in Cincinnati. We are fortunate to have one of the top pediatric hospitals in the world here in Cincinnati. But even if you could afford a hotel um, for a month, three months, a year, which most people cannot. Um, it's that sense of community and the people when you walk through the door at the end of a long day at the hospital and there's people to greet you, ask how your child's doing, ask what you need. Everyone knows what you're going through. And that being just steps away, we are right across the street from Cincinnati Children's. Um, most of our family's kids are pretty critical. Um, many are in ICU and it's just really important to be that close um, to be available to your child at a moment's notice. So the first house opened in Philadelphia in uh, 1974, 
And so that's just 47 years old, which for an international charity is actually pretty young. We're a fairly um, young charity overall. Our house here in Cincinnati opened in 1982, our first house, which was on the edge of Cincinnati children's property. And then since then, we've expanded three times. Um, I joined um, in 98, as Al said. <laughs> we've been working together 23 years. We're kind of dating ourselves. And I was lucky Al helped hire me. And I thought, this is the best job in the whole world. And I'm here to tell you, 23, late, 23 years later, it still is. Like, I am so fortunate and so lucky to do the work that I do. So we went from, um, originally we were 21 bedrooms. Then we went to 48, then we went to 78, and then last year we opened um, to a total of 177. And that is the exterior of our new building, that green and white behind the little girl. That's the courtyard view of our new building. So there are 377 Ronald McDonald houses around the world. Each one of them looks and feels different. They each have their own local board of trustees, and they've each hired their own architect. So it is not a cookie cutter building. Everyone is unique. And ours is really Cincinnati's house, and especially with our expansion, we have a lot of touches um, from Cincinnati. This is a mural um, in our house that has our mission and our core values. And if you look closely, you'll notice Fiona, Great American Tower, Music Hall, the fountain from Fountain Square, um, part of the Red Stadium. So throughout the house, you'll see, that here's one of our guest bedrooms. And um, you know, if you think about hotels you've stayed in and the artwork in the rooms, um, some of them are fabulous, some of them are just terrible. <laughs> what we came up with is we hired four local photographers to take images of our beautiful city, and then we blew them up and put them on canvas. So you'll see the fountain here in this room um, from Fountain Square, but they all have pictures of some are from Spring Grove, some are from the zoo, um, different parks around town, the river and downtown, so they're really beautiful images. Just one more example, this is our donor wall of all the people who made our new house possible. And you can see it's kind of a whimsical skyline of downtown. A few changes, it's not exact, but you'll recognize a lot of buildings there. And that's the Ohio River, obviously. <laughs> so when people think of Ronald McDonald House, they often think or ask, how is it related to McDonald's? How is it related to Cincinnati Children's? And they are both founding partners of the house. They're both generous donors to the house. Um, but we are also independent from both. Um, McDonald's is um, very involved on the board and with donor relationships. They help supply food and coffee and ice machines and all those types of things we need at the house that they also use. And then Cincinnati Children's, um, also um, obviously the main beneficiary of our house in that we care for their families. And then, you know, McDonald's also a beneficiary from the marketing side and showing the relationship and um, the care they put into each community by supporting their local Ronald McDonald House. So I want to talk a little bit about the reach of our charity, uh, internationally and locally. This is little Vincent. He's with us 183 nights. He had a four organ transplant. It's amazing what some of these families go, th go through. So this is overall for RMHC worldwide. And there's a lot of numbers here, but just a few things I want to point out. RMHC saves families $935 million a year in hotel and meals and related costs. You'll see in the center are three core programs, Ronald McDonald Houses, Ronald McDonald Family Rooms, which is kind of a hospitality suite sometimes with sleeping rooms within the hospital, and then the Caremobile Program. Um, we are in 65 countries and regions around the world. And look at that, almost, there's 490,000 volunteers. By the way, I wanted a show of hands. How many people in here have been involved, either with Cincinnati's house or another one, as a volunteer or a donor or any sort of relationship? Look at that, that's amazing. Thank you all. It was nice to see a lot of familiar faces today. And um, I met Nancy on the way in, found out she volunteered years ago at our house. And um, I'm just appreciative to all of you in the room who've been involved. And if you haven't been, I'll, I can tell you how at the end, if you'd like to get involved. <laughs> um, so here locally, so our numbers are down for last year, obviously, because of COVID. It changed a lot of the way we operate. Um, 
And we had, you know, the hospital had their census affected as everyone did around the world. So last year we had 622 families who lived at our house, average stay of 48 nights. So again, think back to um, having to have a hotel and what that would cost for 48 nights, not just the room, but also your meals, your transportation, your parking, um, that really adds up and is just cost prohibitive to almost all of our families. Our families came from 38 states and four countries, and here locally we saved them just over $3 million in lodging and meals. So the things our house offers, this little <laughs> circle picture here is our um, toy closet. So when a family checks in, the child gets a little toy ticket, and if it's their birthday or if they're having a rough day at the hospital, they can come choose a toy. It's kind of like, if you remember the old Johnny's toys when you go in the castle, it's like that, but better. <laughs> um, so we offer families a comfortable bedroom. They can eat three meals a day for free at the house. Um, and our meal program we'll talk about in a minute, but it's pretty amazing. Um, many amenities in rooms on site, which you'll see here in a minute. Laundry, activities for the kids, and like we said, just steps away from the hospital. We have two types of rooms. We have short-term rooms, um, which are for families staying one to four nights, and you can book those ahead of time and know that they'll be ready and you can check in. And then our regular stay is booked from our waiting list, and these families stay anywhere from a few weeks to up to two years is the maximum stay. And we do have some families who've been here um, up to two years. So um, just a little bit about how we got to be the largest house in the world. And I want to say, like, for me personally, it was never a goal at first to be the largest house. We just always wanted to be the best house, and we always want to be a model in our RMHC system. It's a very collaborative charity. Um, the houses locally and all around the world get together and share best practices, and we take a lot of pride in our house being a model for um, guest services and for um, fundraising and donor stewardship. And it's a, just a really amazing system of sharing information. So to us, we always wanted to be the best and do things really, really well. But it became apparent that the need was there, that um, we were not really fulfilling our mission because we were turning away so many families. So before we expanded, we would have 80 to 90 families a night on our wait list. We were turning away more families than we actually served. And our board and our leadership knew that we had to do better and we had to find a solution to be able to care for these families because if they couldn't get into the house, most were not getting a hotel room, maybe for a night or two, but they were mostly sleeping in the bed next to the child's um, bedside. <clears throat> and if you've spent any time with a relative in the hospital, you know you don't get a good night's sleep sleeping in a chair or even a pull-out chair in someone's room at the hospital. There's interruptions all night long. And part of what's so important about what we do is a family who is well rested is able to better care for and support their child because they feel better themselves. If you've had a good meal and a good night's sleep, you're better prepared emotionally to go in there and support your child every day. So the need was definitely there and we started talking about what this could look like. And at first it was kind of daunting. We're like, this is a really big house and this is gonna cost a lot of money. But we had to just trust that with the right people um, and the right strategy that it would come together. So there was a lot of planning, a lot of talking to stakeholders. So we had, um, GBBN was our architects. We met with the Avondale community. We met with groups of volunteers. We met with our whole staff. We met with the board. We met with donors. Um, Jim Yunker, who's a member here who couldn't be here today, but we worked with Jim to do um, kind of a abbreviated feasibility study to talk to our donors and see what type of project they would support and at what level. So Jim was really helpful in the early stages of planning the campaign. <clears throat> um, there's so many meetings. If you've ever worked on a construction project, there's so many meetings and decisions. Even if you've done a renovation in your house, you know how many things there are to talk about and choose and pick, and, and this is just on a much bigger scale. But it was really, um, an amazing experience. I kind of thrive on that, and I, I kind of get a rush from all that, but um, it was really a case of the timing being right and us having the right people involved, including our amazing board, and Al, as I mentioned, is a member, um, but our board was wonderful throughout this whole process. So this was our uh, campaign logo, More Rooms, More Love. 
One of the things that really helped us, and I know there's Ken and a couple other people from charities in this room, is we had paid a lot of attention to donor stewardship over the years. So we um, show so much gratitude to the people who make our house possible and make it very personal. And that really paid off for us um, because our, our donor base is not a who's who list of you know, super wealthy people in Cincinnati. It's not like arts groups where you have a lot of really well-known people and they have, you know, lots of friends and they're all big donors. We were really starting from a base of thousands of caring, compassionate people who'd given over the years and who we had told them over the years again and again how much we appreciated them. And they were ready to um, help step up and make this house possible. As Al mentioned, it was a $52 million campaign, 42 of that was capital, um, and the rest was to help cover incremental operating expenses for the first three to four years. So that was a big number. <laughs> um, but one thing that really helped us um, was, I don't know if any of you have heard of a um, company called AbbVie. It's a pharmaceutical company out of Chicago. Um, they, their CEO decided to make $300 million gifts to charities, and he um, charged his leadership team with picking which charities they should support. And so the first one um, was a gift to Puerto Rico to help rebuild the island. It went to two charities in Puerto Rico. Second one went to RMHC. Um, I was about to say globally, it was really US focused because someone on their leadership team had had a sick child, had spent time in the hospital, and knew the value of RMHC. So they made a $100 million gift and they decided that, um, and again this goes to donor intent, what they wanted to do was make, to help care for more families. And the way to do that was to help provide more rooms. And so they decided to support the 32 Ronald McDonald houses that were currently expanding and give up to a certain percent of their capital budget. And so we were the largest expansion. Um, we got in just under the wire, <laughs> the right timing, like with our process. We just met the deadline for this gift. And it was a two-page proposal that we submitted to our headquarters, which resulted in a gift of $13.5 million. It was amazing. So that, you don't see that very often, <laughs> um, but that really um, was instrumental in helping us meet our goal and um, to raise all the money we needed to for this building. Just a couple other things, so much communication. I mean, you cannot communicate enough with a project this big, with um, all the stakeholders, both internal and external. Um, one thing I had to do was take a crash course and learn as much as I could about change management. Um, because as I mentioned, like I love change, but some people hate it and it terrifies them. And so there was a lot of understanding how um, you help people get to a comfort level with change and what they need to feel that comfort level. And so um, we learned a lot about that and tried to implement that during the way. And then, um, you know, we never dreamed we'd be opening in the middle of a pandemic. We were so excited to show off the new building to all the donors who made it possible. And of course, it turned into a virtual opening, <laughs> which we made as fun as we could, but um, it just wasn't quite the same. And then we had all these um, projections for occupancy, which of course we just had to kind of throw away and start over because COVID has changed everything for everyone. Um, but we're getting there. We're at, I mentioned we have 177 rooms. Right now we have 81 filled. And we could house a lot more families, but families who used to come for um, elective procedures are often now staying home because of COVID. Some people aren't comfortable with communal living, even though the house is meticulously cleaned and everyone wears masks all the time and we've taken all the precautions we can. Some people just don't um, want to live communally during a pandemic, which I can certainly understand. So um, hopefully this volume will work. I wanna show you a quick video that gives you just a little taste of our expansion. Cincinnati's Ronald McDonald House is more than just a place for families to spend the night. We have an incredible room that we call our active play space. It's so much more than an indoor playground. There's light and a sound system so that as kids are in the space, the scene will change around them. What do you think about the active space, Kinsley May? I like it. Even the 
the sound in there is just so calming. And some kids can't be outside at all, so yeah. it gives you the option. When it's nice outside, families love our outdoor playground. There's something here for everyone. I think like the place in the playground, indoor and outdoor one, I think it's just gonna, one, take kids' minds away from what's going on, and two, physically get them where so they can wind down. They can be a kid again. Yeah, yeah. escape from the adult things and yeah. go back to just being a kid. Our playrooms offer a variety of toys and games. The craft room, I think, was your favorite, wasn't it? What was your favorite part of the craft room? That you could write on the wall. That you could write on the wall, something you don't get to do at home, huh? <laughs> it just gives them a, a space to be creative, you know? Our arts and crafts space is a great space where families can be creative together. The walls are actually giant dry erase boards, so we love to see the masterpieces that are drawn on these walls. Our game room has the latest gaming systems. All of these spaces will help families relax and recharge after a long day at the hospital. Our Taste of Hope kitchen helps us feed 177 families every day. It features professional grade equipment, plenty of space for our volunteer groups, and a serving line where families can select from a variety of healthy, delicious meals. We also have a separate kitchen space for guest families so that they can prepare their own food on their own schedules. We can accommodate up to four families at once in this space. Many of our guest families live in our house for weeks or months or even over a year at a time. Our bedrooms feature ample built-in storage to accommodate lots of personal items and medical equipment. The bathrooms are spacious and can support a variety of medical needs. Each of our bedrooms features large windows and artwork showcasing the beauty of Cincinnati. Sleek, modern, clean. The old rooms were nice, but you could tell they were like a little dated, which I didn't really care because, you know, it's a room. It's just upgraded and it looks very nice. Very, very nice. While we are fortunate to be so close to the hospital, sometimes it's important for our guest families to feel like they can get away from it all. Our rooftop offers a peaceful oasis with breathtaking views of the surrounding communities. No matter the time of day, this space offers families a break from the routine and a chance to catch their breath and relax outdoors. It's incredible, the scenery. There has been a tremendous change since the last time we were here. Now we have this wonderful tower that you have now provided for so many more families to enjoy, and it's all for the better. Thank you. I'm glad you could see just a little bit of it. We'd love to give you a full tour someday if anyone would like to see it. But um, if you feel inspired by any of this to get involved with our house, or if you've been involved before and want to get more involved, I just want to tell you a few ways that you can support the house. Um, we have just brought back our volunteering program. So um, we have guest services volunteers who do two four-hour shifts a month. Some do more, but that's the minimum requirement. Um, you can host a snack or an activity at the house. And then the Red Shoe Crew is our young professionals group. I want to thank all of you because Rotarians have been supportive of our meals program for years. And I know many in the room um, have made a meal at the house. Um, our program now, it might be a little um, different if you were there years ago, but um, it's called Taste of Hope, and you work with our chef. We have a chef on staff who guides your group through making a meal. It's kind of like a fun little cooking lesson with friends, and um, it's great for team building uh, with coworkers. We have school groups who do it. The one requirement, actually two requirements, you have to be 16 or older, and you have to be fully vaccinated um, to volunteer at the house. Um, church or civic groups, sometimes people do it to celebrate their birthdays, they'll bring a group of friends. Um, there is a donation to help cover the cost of the food, um, which is $400 a meal. So sometimes people pull together and they each, you know, give $40 or something like that. Or if it's a company, sometimes the company just pays for their team to go. Um, and it can be any group, up to 12 people, and you can book this on our website. You can see the dates that are available. Of course, making a gift to the house. We have monthly and annual giving. You can sponsor a room for the year. You can pay for a few nights of a family stay um, and also plan gifts. 
You can donate items to our house on our website. We have a wish list with the items that we use a lot at the house, and some people will do a donation drive with their church or with a group of friends and donate items that the house can use, including the toys for the toy closet, which you can see the kids love. I have to tell you the other day, it was so sweet. There was um, a little kid staying at the house, and he was in a wheelchair. He and his brother are both in wheelchairs. They're both adopted, and they, one of them had a service dog with them. And um, the little boy said, I want my dog to have the toy ticket, and I want her. She's such a good dog. I want her to be able to choose something. And we don't have dog toys in the closet, but um, they gave the dog, the dog, the tickets are laminated, and the dog put the ticket in her mouth and walked down to the toy closet, and we opened, we have a little magic wand that opens the door, and the dog came in and chose this big lavender stuffed unicorn, it was like a stuffed animal, and she carries it everywhere. She hasn't torn it apart, it was the cutest thing, but I just thought, oh, that's so sweet that this little boy would give his dog the ticket. I think we gave him another one for himself for being so sweet with the dog. Um, and then events, we have um, an annual golf outing and a red tie gala, which unfortunately we're not having this year because of COVID, um, but hopefully that'll be back and even bigger next year. And then you can also create an online fundraiser or host a community fundraiser um, to help support the house. And then uh, corporate partnerships, we have great relationships with so many great Cincinnati companies, GE and Fifth Third and 8451 and TQL, the, the lot of companies send groups to the house. And um, you can either give as a company, you can donate product, um, cause-related marketing, um, or engage your employees through making a meal at the house. And you can see this quote here from GE, but it's a really wonderful opportunity to spend some time together, as you all do often as Rotarians, and help give back and support others. Um, this little guy, Owen, um, he's still with us. At the time I made these slides, it had been 156 nights. He has a really rare genetic condition. He's from Dayton. But imagine every day, like, being at the hospital supporting your child and how exhausting it is, and then being able to walk across the street. There's a hot, delicious meal waiting for you. There's other people whose kids have the same doctors or the same conditions, and they become your kind of surrogate family while you're in Cincinnati, and then you're able to collapse and get a good night's sleep. So that is what our house means to families. Um, here's one mom who said, having your child in the hospital is a stressful and scary experience. The house has been such a blessing. So I wanna close by showing you a really short video just showing what the house means to the families who get to live there. We're from Orlando, Florida, and we're here because Brantley has fancone anemia. Kason was diagnosed with stage four neuroblastoma. I'm Maria and this is Aram. Kinsley May's journey started in Omaha, Nebraska. We're not from around here. I am from Dayton, Ohio. I am here because I have an eight-week-old son that has a very rare syndrome called wolf Hishhorn syndrome. We literally have to live day by day trying to figure out what his life is going to be like. Not knowing if he'll walk, talk, crawl. It's not fair, you know, that he's so little and he just turned two, so his communication skills. You know, he gets very frustrated when he's trying to tell us something, and we don't understand what he's saying. The biggest challenge in, in trying to keep communication back home open, too, because it's hard, because everybody at home wants to know what's going on. The first couple weeks staying in the hospital, I was sleeping in his recliner next to him in a pod. So a pod is where you share a room with six other babies and there was no privacy at all. To be in the NICU, it's it's hard because people think, oh, it's just, you know, they're just sick babies, but some babies don't make it out. And to see that happen to other families, is that's a tough thing to face. As a mom, you want to be here for your kids. This house has allowed me to be here for Owen. It's a complete game changer. I feel like it's almost like a safe haven. They could be a kid again. Yeah. Yeah. Escape from the adult things and yeah. go back to just being a kid. You guys use every little bit for the kids, even down to the meals every day, and how important that is. And you know, you think about the financial hardship that a lot of families are going through when they have a sick kiddo. It's been our second home, 
and we are so very thankful and, you know, blessed to be here and be this close to the hospital. And everybody has been phenomenal that we've come in contact with. Anything that you need is here. You get a diagnosis like this and then you really realize minutes matter yeah. every day. This is little Skylar, she had a liver transplant. Um, the, I just wanna close by saying we can't do what we do without you and without our community. Like this beautiful new building was made possible because we live in such a caring and generous city. And um, it's just a privilege for all of us um, to work with all of you, everyone who's made our house possible and supports our families uh, while they're here in Cincinnati. So um, I'll stop and see if anyone has any questions I can answer for our last few minutes together. Anyone? Yes, we have time for about two questions. Do you have? Okay. Sure. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry, I got, I got the mic. Okay. okay, I'll pass it. Oh, my question was yeah, simply, do you, uh, that's quite an operation. Do you have any other outside sources of income, supplemental, uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, anything that helps That's pay a great for the question. operations? Yeah, we, um, we'll bill Medicare and Medicaid when we can for families. It's a very small portion of our budget. Um, we ask families, if they're able to, to contribute $25 a night, um, but most contribute about $11 a night, and we cover the rest through fundraising. So it, um, we are not a United Way agency. We don't get any city, state, or federal grant funding. And so it is um, primarily individuals, businesses, and foundations who support our annual budget each year. Yeah, thank you. Are you a member of the Rotary Club number 17? <laughs> Am I personally? I'm not. Uh, are you recruiting young, me? We need young members to get our rate low, so I would, somebody's <laughs> gotta give this woman an application That's before right. she leaves. That's right. Thank you so very much, and uh, we'll continue that conversation. Oh, oh, we got one more here. <laughs> Just want to thank you. In 1988, my son was diagnosed with lymphoma cancer, and that was a trauma to go through, but you're right. I'm one who's actually lived through it, and uh, thank you for what you do. Mm, thank you for sharing that. Let's give Jennifer a round of applause. That was a very great, inspiring presentation. Jennifer, thank you so much for updating us. We're so glad to have you with us today, and thank you for sharing. Um, and in keeping with fighting disease and, pol and, and uh, eradication of polio, our Rotary Club has been in conjunction with Rotary International since uh, 1980s with the eradication of polio. And on behalf of your presentation today, we would like to present you with this Rotary pin, and we will give a donation for the eradication of polio in your name, in your honor. Thank you. Thank you again, Jennifer, and thank you again as well, uh, District Governor Carol Hughes, for being with us today. We have one meeting this afternoon at 1.30. That will be the Rotaract Committee will be meeting in the Julep Room on the third floor. And please remember that we also have a Women in Rotary event coming up at Top Golf on September 24th or 25th, so make sure it's on that Friday. Make sure you're there or you sign up, meet with Christy either afterwards or complete the form. Uh, if you have a family member who'd like to join, make sure they get the information. We'll be at Top Golf in Westchester. Also, next week, again, a reminder, please do not come to the Hilton, beautiful Hilton, next week for lunch. We will not be meeting here. It will be our road show. We will be back in the Hilton on the 30th. We will be at the uh, Urban Revel Wine winery for a 5.30 to 7.30 meeting with the owner of that particular establishment as our speaker. And with all of that, make it a great day and serve to change lives. Thank you for being here and meeting adjourned. <laughs>